7,000 years ago, a painter entered a cave in the Sahara Desert uh, in the southern part of Algeria and painted a shaman, a portrait of a shaman, with a bee head and with mushrooms growing out of the body. Those mushrooms are psilocybin mushrooms, or what we call magic mushrooms, um, and were evidence early on of the use of that medicine starting in the Sahara Desert, but amazingly, as uh, archaeologists continued to look throughout Asia, Africa, and southern Europe, they saw similar versions of that painting or something close to it throughout that part of the world. So I bring this up not because this is old history and it's something that is interesting, but actually because we owe a great debt of gratitude going back seven millennia to those early healers whose inheritance we were given in today's world as we are now exploring the potential of the use of psychedelic medicines or natural medicines uh, for mental health care. Three streams of uh, reality are coming together, I think, that are bringing us to a place where this investigation of psychedelic medicines uh, can be uh, raised up in the way that it has been in the last decade or so. One is the increasing mental health crisis. There are several reasons for this crisis. One is inequitable access to care. Now, that's not a medicine issue, that's an issue of social policy that we have not yet addressed. But also, the issue that we're seeing with mental health care is that there are few treatment options that actually will transform a person that is struggling with mental illness so that that person's suffering and that person's struggle can actually dissolve in a significant way. And so because of that intractable number of mental health conditions, and that could be depression and PTSD or eating disorders or any number of other um, struggles that people are having, there was a motivation to look for other ways of providing help and support to people that were in this situation. The second stream that's come together is the fact that over the last decade, because of the persistence of starting out a very few number of researchers and scientists, now a just significantly larger number, um, there was a new wave of interest in looking at how psychedelic medicines could serve a role in creating a healing environment for people that were struggling. And we'll talk more about that in, in a second. The third stream of activity that's come together, and we are in Colorado where I think many of you are familiar with that stream, is that there is an incredibly uh, quick move toward legalization of the use of these psychedelic medicines in various ways. Psilocybin, which is used to work with people that have depression, uh, is going to be legal in Oregon to be used in January of 2024, and in Colorado about a year after that. MDMA, MDMA is, uh, many of us know as ecstasy, a party drug. This is not the party drug. This is the pure form of MDMA. Is now in its phase three clinical trials around the world. MDMA's clinical trials were approved by the Food and Drug Administration, however, mainly because it showed such promise in working with PTSD, and two incredibly visionary researchers at the Veterans Administration in the Bronx, New York, were able to convince the um, FDA that allowing these trials to deal with PTSD, something that was absolutely not being addressed by the traditional therapies, was something that was worth looking at. And because of the VA's influence, these trials uh, were undertaken. However, there are 20 million people in the United States that have a diagnosis in one form or another of PTSD, most of whom did not serve, most of whom were not veterans. And so the need for some kind of support for um, that population is very significant. This is not a miracle in the sense that there's no risk and there's certainty, uh, but the uh, promise of the impact of these medicines is significant. The high percentage of people that used MDMA through these clinical trials as opposed to those that used the placebo, 
and placebo is a little funny. If anybody has ever had an MDMA experience, you probably know whether or not you had the placebo or not. So, so it, it's, it's not quite the antibiotic and sugar pill thing. But nonetheless, so it, it is a challenge. Nonetheless, um, very high percentage of those that were part of the trial do not have diagnosable PTSD symptoms following the course of the trial therapy, which is a sort of remarkable thing well worth looking at. This is a complex topic because I think there's much controversy, there's concern, there's fear. We have to get it right this time. 65 years ago or so, when Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, known to many of us in Boulder as Ramdas at Harvard, were doing work with LSD, there was great promise then as well. And then, my point of view, Dr. Leary went a little far in terms of the way he evangelized the use of LSD. Tune in, turn on, drop out was not probably the best way to talk about a serious scientific study. So we ended up in a situation where we are now working with substances like psilocybin, like MDMA, and for many, many, many millions of people, those substances are the butt of a joke. But basically, something not to be taken seriously. And on the other hand, there's great fear. People who have experienced either their own difficult um, reaction to the use of psychedelic substances, even if they didn't know what they had because of the lack of any kind of control, or people that observed others, loved ones, friends, and so on, there's fear that these substances actually are more risky than they are helpful. And so where we have to be now in this ecosystem of uh, research is to ensure that we are treating the research as seriously as possibly can be done, as, as much as is done with other sorts of medicines, very clear science, very clear metrics. And while I think the move is quick, when you consider that it took almost 20 years for medical marijuana to even be considered a medical um, use, it's taken less than five for MDMA and psilocybin to be seen as medicinal in value. While it's quick, we need to be very deliberate. One of the ways I think that we can be deliberate is by ensuring that through this research process, there's a level of humility that surrounds the work that is being done. A recognition that 7,000 years ago, ancestors began to take a look at what the impact would be of these medicines. And while there are probably not a lot of books and there's probably not a lot of way to go back that far to get the learning directly, there's an oral tradition throughout the indigenous communities around the world, and we have to be open to hearing that oral tradition in any way that we can. It's not so unusual to see medical practitioners and spiritual healers being together in the same person in many cases. It's really only been in the last 200 years or so that the science of medicine and the mystery of the spiritual experience have separated. Because before that, there was an easy movement between what we meant by spirituality and what we meant by healing. Mind, body, healing also included soul healing, or whatever you would like to call that, but it was an integrated whole. In the last couple hundred years, we've done some separation, and now there's an opportunity for this to come back together. What do we do with this research. The researchers are, on the one hand, doing very traditional science research. They're looking at molecules, they're adjusting the molecules, and they're hoping that they're going to come out with a substance that's going to have some kind of impact on a particular problem. But we're also talking about a healing journey, and that healing journey is very much like a spiritual journey uh, of any kind. It requires, and I will quote Leary again, because this one he got right, I believe, um, Set and setting. And set and setting is something that Larry talked about around LSD. Set meaning mindset, if you will. A commitment by the, the uh, clinician, the healer, to work with the, the client, the patient, well before the medicine journey itself. To set the ground, 
to set the expectations, to set what shouldn't be expected, and then to move into the journey, the sort of um, path that the healing uh, uh, healer will take with their patient, and then to have the commitment to spend time afterward, whatever that is, if there's how many sessions there are, to really integrate the experience. Now, this is not the typical way that we're used to medicine in the West. We are not talking about walking into an exam room with a doctor who is primarily looking down at a laptop, knowing they've got 12 minutes, otherwise the insurance company is not going to pay them anymore, sending you off with a chemical, and worrying about who else is in the waiting room. This is a commitment to be a healer in this space, and it's something which we need to be sure that we're training clinicians, and not just clinicians, because there's room in this healing journey for social workers, for chaplains, for others in the health profession, and certainly for therapists and doctors and nurses and so on. But we have to be able to be clear that the commitment that is being made is a commitment that addresses time in a very different way. So that's the set. The setting, a couple of different aspects. One is the physical aspect, which is, again, think of the exam room. It is not an exam table with a paper cover on it. It is bad Muzak and a bad fluorescent light. But it needs to be a space that actually is healing in itself, that's nurturing, that is calming, that is um, something where the five to six to seven potentially hour experience that a healer is going to have with, with a patient is going to be contained in a way which is actually uplifted and is something which actually leads itself to a kind of part of the healing uh, process altogether. The setting also means, as I said a little bit a minute ago about time, requires the clinical practitioner to absolutely drop any preconception about what that journey is going to be like, either how long it's going to take or what's going to happen. And so while at Europa University we train clinicians in psychedelic-assisted therapy, there's a whole lot that we say flat out, we can't teach you. What we can teach you is we can teach you to be present in the space, we can teach you to hopefully drop your preconceptions and enter the situation from a place of sort of not knowing, but we can't teach you what else is going to happen. Some patients are going to be lying on a, on a bed or a sofa, they're going to have earphones, they're going to be listening to music, and six hours later they will get up and there'll be some conversation about what might have happened. Others from two minutes in will be on their feet and moving around or going to, over to a table and doing some piece of art or something else, and others may go back and forth between some expression of fear and concern and some expression of elation and hope. And in all of those cases, you've got a clinical practitioner who has to be able to hold the space and to be able to support that patient in the journey that they are taking together. Clinical practitioners can actually be trained to know their own minds, to understand how to make space and time very elastic, to be humble and to drop their preconceptions. Those are completely learnable. We're in a place right now where because of the MDMA trial's success, it's very likely that in a year or so, there'll be federal approval to use MDMA across the country. Right now, the state-by-state -state legalization of psilocybin, which is great, is moving along at a glacial pace for obvious reasons. It's complicated in every single state. But once MDMA can be prescribed, we are going to have this opportunity to create an ecosystem of healing and something where the demand is going to be great, the opportunity for healing is going to be great, and we have a chance to actually address a number of these intractable mental health problems in a way that we have not been able to do. However, to do that is going to require everybody. There are, there's nobody that has the sole expertise in this work. We need people that are going to be sure that there's equitable access to the medicine. We need people to be sure that there are sufficient number of training opportunities so that cl clinical practitioners can come out of the training ready to be 
uh, of great help and support. We need to take a look at breaking open to some extent what we think of as the medical system. We cannot have doctors or masters or PhD level therapists, one of them, one patient, six hours, and imagine this is going to be anything other than an opportunity for the 1% or even less than the 1%. So we need to take a look at a system which allows for a much more distributed model. We also need to understand that there is tremendous wisdom from the indigenous communities, and there is tremendous concern in these indigenous communities about um, having their medicine, healing, spiritual heritage basically appropriated by those that are not part of that community. And our obligation in that case is to make sure that we are both allies of those communities and that we do everything we can to learn from them. So I would say that we are at the moment now where there is tremendous risk, tremendous opportunity. There's ample ways in which every single one of us can share in this work, whether that's directly in the um, healing and therapeutic process, whether it's in the policy process, whether it's in insisting that we come back to a place where the sacred and the science come together again. All of those are completely open to every one of us to participate in. We are greatly fortunate in Colorado that we are at the epicenter of this work, and so we will make our mistakes here and hopefully correct them. We will have our successes here. And so it's an opportunity for all of us uh, to take advantage of what this new frontier would look like. Thank you.